from Toronto, Ontario, and a traditional Ukrainian folk song about a neighbor girl, Susidka. Dobry den, shanovne radio suchachita vitayu vas vsih na radio peredachu nash holos, radio krinskoho korinya. Yaka podiesi vam si hodni, tak yaki kožni serede, zudenaci toi do trenaci toi hodene, nachveli si HLY sto adeni si mfm umisti na najmo. Prima krifoni si hodenu je Pavlina, a nastupnu hodenu bude z vame Oksana. Djako ju ščorišalo je prvi bude z nama nastupnih dvoh hoden, me majmo dužati kavi na vene na sjednišnji programi. Hello there and welcome to Nosh Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio, coming to you on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. I'm Paula Temšek makori Pokorinska Pavlina, and I'll be your host for this first hour. Oksana will be here at 12 noon to host the show in Ukrainian. I'm delighted to have you with us. We've got a great program lined up for you. In this hour, we have Victor's Vignettes, and this is an encore presentation, but it is about uh, growing up in the so- former Soviet Union, and it is a timeless tale, and one that probably can't be heard often enough. As well, we've got something brand new, an interview with Danny Stewart, and Danny is the composer of a hit musical called Strike, based on the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike, and now that screenplay has been turned into a movie, which will be premiering in Canadian theaters coast to coast at the end of this month, and we've had a chance to track Danny down and uh, have a little chat with him, and he'll give us... Uh, the the behind-the-scenes scoop on what that is all about. So stay tuned for that. We've also got our usual proverb of the week, other items of interest, and great Ukrainian music. And coming up next is Kalabai from Edmonton from a CD called Kolomeka Casualties and a song about a gypsy girl, Sihanka. <laughs> Ціганочка молода, ціганочка молода. Ой, на горі цігани стояли, ой, на горі цігани стояли, стояла думала. Ціганочка молода, стояла думала, ціганочка молода, ціганочка молода. Один ціган не п'є, не гуляє, один ціган не п'є, не гуляє, стояла думала, ціганочка молода, стояла думала. Ціганочка молода, ціганочка молода. На цігаку свою поглядає, на цігаку свою поглядає. Стояла думала, ціганочка молода, стояла думала. 
blast from the past for you there. That was from a CD called Ukrainian Village Music Historic Recordings, 1928 to 1933, put out by the Arhuli Music Label back in 1994. And that was Joseph Pizio with a Pete Kometska Kolomeka. Now, you won't hear that kind of music in very many places other than a Ukrainian radio program on a station much like CHLY 101.7 FM here in Nanaimo. I just want to remind you that we are in the throes of our 2019 Fall Fun Drive here at CHLY. Now, every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., you hear Ukrainian programming, the first hour in English with me and Oksana Pobodazhnik presents and produces the second hour of Nasholas in Ukrainian. And together we strive to bring you programming that, like the rest of the programming here on CHLY, is unique and authentic. CHLY is community-oriented and listener-supported. We're volunteer-driven, non-profit, and we rely on donations to outfit the station with things like broadcast equipment to bring you the unique and authentic programming that you love. In the past, listener donations have helped us to purchase equipment like handheld recorders for interviews out in the field, new chairs in the studio to reduce on-air noise, and uh, new headphones, which are absolutely crucial (laughs) when you're in doing a live show in our studios. Future donations will help us to purchase new computers, which are getting pretty long in the tooth, and Yeah, really old. (laughs) And uh, we'll need to replace our mixing board as well. All these things cost money, and we rely on listeners to help us to purchase these necessities. So it's easy to donate. You can just go to www.chly.ca forward slash donate. Or you can give us a call at 250-716-3410 to make a donation over the phone. We encourage you to become a sustaining donor because that just makes it easy. It goes on your credit card and um, you just pay off the balance at the end of the month and I don't have to worry about it. And you can ensure that your support reaches us. And that can be as little as $3.50 or $5 a month, the cost of a cup of coffee or more if you can afford it. You can also make a one-time donation of $60, $120 or whatever amount you can afford. Oksana and I love bringing you Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio every Wednesday from 11 a.m. till 1 p.m. We hope you'll help support our show and this station with a donation. Just go to www.chly.ca forward slash donate or call us at 250-716-3410. Again, that number 250-716-3410 or chly.ca forward slash donate. Thank you so much. Shcherodyakuyu. Now back to our regular programming. Hello, Dobry Deng. My name is Serhi Kaznadi in Toronto, Canada, and I am pleased to narrate Victor's vignettes, stories about life in Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine. These stories were written by Viktor Sergeyev, who lives in Mykolaiv, Ukraine. Viktor worked as freelance technical translator from English, but now has multiple sclerosis, which makes speaking difficult for him. But he finds great joy and a creative outlet in writing and sharing his stories online and here on Nazholos Ukrainian Roots Radio. You can find Viktor's original transcripts along with his commentary and his blog, Vignettes, Life in Ukraine. Links and audio files at nasholos.com. Compulsory Steps Growing Up Soviet Today, I will share with you the typical Soviet childhood, based on my own life experience. In Soviet times, children went through a very rigid process of indoctrination. There were three compulsory steps required of each child in order to grow into a proper Soviet citizen. Children began their studies at the age of seven. The first step was to be admitted to a program called Oktyabryata and become known as one of the so-called October children. The name comes from October, the month in which the Bolshevik Revolution took place. The Ukrainian name for October is Zhovtyn. It is derived from the word for gold, the color that leaves begin to turn in this month. To my mind, Zhovtyn is a much prettier and more descriptive name. 
However, Russian was the lingua franca of the Soviet Union, and speaking other ethnic languages, especially Ukrainian, was frowned upon. In some cases, it was actually dangerous. At the beginning of Oktyabriata, we were all presented with a little badge, a red star with a picture of a blonde little boy in the center of it. None other than Vladimir Lenin, founder of the Soviet Union. Even then, at such a young age, the program struck me as odd, surreal, like some kind of silly childish game. But it was a game the authorities took very seriously. And it was only the beginning of a lifetime of such surreal games. I will never forget this propaganda nursery rhyme from my kindergarten days. Я маленькая девочка, играю и пою. Я Ленина не видела, но я его люблю. That was, of course, in Russian. There was no Ukrainian version. Crucification was in full force. The English translation goes like this. I am a little girl, playing and singing. I haven't seen Lenin, but I love him. Our teachers at school constantly drilled into us, you must always write the word communist with a capital letter, and the word God with a small letter. What an ironic ideological paradox. Did they see, too? By the age of ten, and provided we studied well, we were admitted to the young pioneers. In the early 1920s, the Soviet regime created a pioneer organization modeled on the Western Boy Scouts organization, with the addition, of course, of stringent communist ideology. At this step, we were presented with a red necktie, called a Pionierski Galstuk, and another badge, called Pionierski Znachok. On my blog, you can see a picture with all the three badges along with my original transcript. For the next four years, we were happy and proud to be part of the Young Pioneers. Apart from the communist indoctrination, it was a fun time, just as I imagine it was for boy and girl scouts in the West. However, our necktie gave away our age. At the age of 14, every teenager wants to look older. So once we left the school grounds, we would hide the necktie. At 16, we were admitted to Komsomol, the youth division of the Communist Party. In actual fact, every teenager in the USSR from the age of 14 automatically became a Komsomol member. Only those who studied poorly or were sent to juvenile prisons did not. Children of very religious parents were also excluded. But we had to pretend we were making a conscious and enthusiastic decision to join Komsomol or not. What a decision it was. Did we want access to officially sponsored holidays? Did we want to pursue higher education? Did we want to get a good job, perhaps one with the privilege of going on business trips? As children, we were well aware that there were no tourist trips at all even to socialist countries, for any child whose parents were not high-ranking Communist Party officials. So, did we want to live without even the small pleasures, as few and far between as they were, that came with the Communist Party membership? Well, of course, I joined Komsomol. I wanted the best life possible in that wretched system. Now I pray those days never return, and my daughter and her contemporaries will never have to endure the lunacy and absurdity the previous generation did. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Viktor's Vignettes, stories from the life of Viktor Sergeyev in Mykolaiv, Ukraine. You can find Viktor's original transcripts and commentary at his blog, Vignettes, Life in Ukraine. For audio archives and links, visit www.nashholos.com. So until next time, do pobaczenia.
And a Ukrainian collaboration there for you by Zulu and the fabulous Rozhenetsya, which claims a Canadian connection. And that song was called Mini Mili, My Sweetheart. Vysluchajte radio predaču náš holos radio Krinskoho Korinja na radio stanci CHLY 101 FM u misi nenajmo. Hovorit pavina. You're listening to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. I'm your host this hour, Pavlina. <laughs> Few people get to see their dream pet project, be it a book, screenplay, or whatever, hit the silver screen. But a Ukrainian-Canadian from Winnipeg named Danny Schur did. Danny Schur is the composer, producer, and co-author of the stage musical Strike. It is the story of the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. His musical premiered at Rainbow Stage in Winnipeg's Kildonan Park in 2005 to great acclaim. It received the Kobzar Literary Award in 2006, the Grant McEwen College Kostash Award in 2007, and was adapted into a CBC radio production. Now his musical has been adapted into a movie called Stand. It comes out in theaters coast-to-coast -coast across Canada on November 29th. With me now to tell us a bit more about it is none other than Danny Stier himself. He joins us now by phone from Winnipeg. Well, congratulations, Danny, on this incredible achievement. First of all, you had the stage play, Strike, and now uh, the movie. Yes, and the movie is called Stand, uh, which is caused for some confusion for people. They always say, why isn't the movie called Strike? And the truth is because I wrote a new song called Stand, and the director from that point on said, that's it, we're calling the movie Stand. <laughs> Okay, so it's called Stand. It's based on your your stage play Strike. And you've been working on this for a long time. I mean, I remember uh, when the stage play came out, you'd been working on that for a long time. So yeah. give us, um, first of all, I will, for listeners that aren't familiar with the General Strike of 1919, um, I'd like to, if you wouldn't mind sharing the story, you know, in, in a nutshell about what that. But first of all, tell us the story of your journey in, in telling this story first from, from day one? Well, first and foremost, I'm a Ukrainian-Canadian. Just about every piece of art that I've ever created had a wellspring of my Ukrainian-Canadian-ness. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of my first larger works was the uh, anniversary of the advent of Christianity in Ukraine, for which I wrote a oratorio about uh, Volodymyr and how Christianity came to Ukraine. And it seems that everything I've ever done involved my Ukrainianness. So I was into musicals uh, as a kid, and by about 2000, I left the pop industry. And there again, there was a Ukrainian connection. I had worked with Chantal Kurviazic from Winnipeg, and oh. I was continuing with my career in musicals. In my third musical, I was looking around for the subject and had known peripherally, I think like most people, peripheral knowledge about the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike. There's the famous picture of the overturned streetcar, a very iconic picture from Winnipeg. And I wasn't even contemplating doing something, but I had occasion to speak to the then editor of the Winnipeg Free Press, who might be the most opinionated British newspaper editor on the continent, hmm. Nicholas First. And he quickly oh. said, when I said, what should I do? He said, absolutely, Winnipeg General Strike, international repercussions and contemporary relevance. And I was like, hmm, if a Brit thought that, I clearly have missed something. <laughs> so I went home, picked up the illustrated history of Winnipeg, opened right onto the page of the pictures of the fateful culmination of the strike, which was called Bloody Saturday. And mm -hmm. there it was in one of the captions, the person killed Mike Sikolowski. And a light went on, wait a minute, that's a Slavic name. It could be Polish or Ukrainian. And there is a story here that's greater than just the traditionally written about stuff about the Winnipeg General Strike, which was as a labor story. Mm -hmm. Knowing what I knew of the First World War internment, mm -hmm. all I could think of 
was what was the Ukrainian guy doing getting himself killed virtually on the steps of City Hall in Winnipeg on June 21st, 1919. Mm -hmm. When I started to research Mike's history, it was exactly what I suspected. This would have been someone who would have not been in favor of the strike. He might have sympathized with its undercurrent of, you know, discrimination and the whole economic unfairness of thing at that time. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't have been front and center as an organizer. No. So that dichotomy of someone that you'd think would not have been involved being very involved led to this research and then it became the story not just of the Winnipeg General Strike, but all of society at the time. And what Nicholas was referring to when he said contemporary relevance is just becoming more and more relevant. The story's really uh, not just about the labor issues, but about the discrimination of uh, mm -hmm. minorities and specifically the demonization of immigrants. Wow. So my journey is a long one. At the very first run of the musical Winnipeg's Rainbow Stage, Jeff Goldblum, an American actor, was sitting beside me. And after the uh, stage play was done, he turned to me and said, big story, big ideas, this would make a fantastic movie. And naively, I thought, well, that'll take two years. And it took the better part of 15 years. <laughs> My kids have gotten old and left the house in the time it's taken to make this movie. Wow, wow. So how did you, uh -huh. end, how did you end up to be sitting next to an American movie actor? Uh, as it happened, he was in a relationship with our Canadian Winnipeg female lead, Catherine Reeford. So uh -huh. Jeff came to support her, and I happened to be sitting beside him, and um, that's how it came to pass. Wow. And yeah, had I known that it would have been a 15-year process, I don't know that I would have done it. But, you know, better that I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I suppose you wouldn't have. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't be ta having this conversation now. And these, this film won't yeah. be, you know, wouldn't be about to be released across Canada. So um, that is amazing. Congratulations. And thank you for for the work that you're doing, uh, you've been doing, and, and for your perseverance and, and for taking on that 15-year project. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's worth it. Well, I mean, from my perspective, I think it's worth it. And um, I'm not sure if, if you do, from <laughs> the sounds of things. it's a Well, I do, because the, the bigger story for the Ukrainian community is that our community experience 100 years ago is a metaphor for the immigrant experience now. Um, our community has that brutal history of the First World War internment and the kind of discrimination that was going on on at the time. I can't tell you how many people have approached me and said, you know, my grandfather said that the particular shopkeeper boss came and said, you know, fill in the blank Ukrainian name, you would have had great potential as a uh, manager, but not with that name. <laughs> oh, so this, yeah. is, this is the era of the shame where it was not cool to be Ukrainian. It was mm -hmm. not cool to be anything other than Anglo. And this story that takes place as it happens in Winnipeg, but was taking place all across North America, was what I call the era of the shame. So it's little wonder that as late as the 70s and 80s, my parents carried a very big chip on their shoulder, this business of immigrant shame. So if our community can do anything for current waves of immigrants, it's to say you are wanted, you are accepted, you are important to Canada. That's the big message of the movie, that everyone is wanted uh, and we should all treat each other well. Just to play a little bit of devil's advocate, Danny, um, do, you, do you think that much has changed in the past hundred years? I mean, I think that, I, I personally think that, I, I hope that there has been some progress. <laughs> I mean, it's oh, not, yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. Of course, things have changed for the better. We can point to 
tons of improvements, be it, you know, in the case of labor, there's eight hour days, there are weekends, there are holidays, but there are particular things that the movie draws attention to that unfortunately haven't changed. Although faces and color of skin have changed, there is very much discrimination of immigrants and minorities going on right now. Some might argue to a greater extent. So what I always say is times change, but humans don't. And if, when uh, you hear the phrase that history is circular, that does mean that we you know, occasionally revert to some regressive things that you'd think we would do better at. So, of course, things are better, but there's so many things that you have to wonder, geez, why aren't they better? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the movie really points that out because you're looking at a movie where it's 1919 and, and you clearly get that it's 100 years ago. And if you kind of just get into the movie for a bit, all of a sudden you're struck with the fact that, gee, uh, it kind of seems like today. In particular, there's a character in our movie when uh, an, uh, a senator says to him, it's not illegal to speak one's mind in this country, even for immigrants, to which the reply is, well, then make it illegal. This business of changing laws uh, and changing government norms just to follow the whims of individuals uh, in government, that's unfortunately something that's been done forever and (laughs) was clearly done 100 years ago and is being done now. So you definitely see that there are, there are parallels to what is going on today, and there is a lesson in this movie, and people in today's world can relate to that story. Yeah. What I always say is 1919 is a metaphor for today. You cannot watch this movie without picking many, many parallels to today. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the reason you do a period movie, because on one hand, it's just kind of, fun to watch a period movie but Mm -hmm. that's not why you do it because they're expensive you don't put people in costumes just for kicks Mm -hmm. what it is is a way to talk about today without it being a documentary (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's it's a metaphor yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and uh so tell us about the um it it became a movie took took you 15 years to (laughs) to yeah to to get to this point and and what point are we at now? <laughs> well, the reason it took 15 years is because uh, period movies are expensive. We had budgets ranging between 7 and $12 million, and in the end it cost 7 Now, that sounds like a ton of money, but it's also less than one Game of Thrones episode. But for a Canadian movie, that's an awful, awful lot. Mm-hmm. So fully four years of my life was devoted to raising the money. My partner, Cal Harrison, and I traveled the world, literally from Geneva to Washington, all across the United States, raising money from union partners who saw in this movie a positive union story, not unlike Norma Ray. So about a third of the money came there. A third of the money came from just private investors, largely Manitoban, hmm. uh, but also all across the world. And then a third of the money comes, as with all movies from the film, tax credits, where the government pays you back money having employed real humans. Mm -hmm. But that was a long and arduous process. I put on an awful, awful lot of air miles Mm -hmm. doing that. So just that part of making a movie is an extremely hard slog. Yeah. But we knew we had a good movie. And in the end, that was what was recognized during uh, the Toronto Film Festival. We had three shows that were sold out, and Cineplex recognized that the movie was not only good, but had an audience in all of the, it's called affinity audience, all the people that would be interested, Mm -hmm. and rewarded us with a cross-Canada opening, uh, opening on November 29th including out your way, Victoria, (laughs) Nanaimo, Vancouver, and all across the country. Wow, amazing. So, Danny, for those who may not, for whatever reason, be able to uh, take in the movie uh, this round, uh, will there be opportunities in the future to see it? 
Well, the way it works is the following. You're given one week guaranteed. If it does well enough, you get another week. If it does well enough, you get another week. So our whole goal is that on November 29th, when it opens, and the 30th and the 1st, that opening weekend is the critical, critical thing. And if enough people go on the Monday, a decision is made to renew it for another week. And we're quietly confident that because there's so many ways in for the movie, there's history. There's musical. It is, after all, a very entertaining musical. Mm -hmm. Uh, A non-traditional musical. It's not a singing and dancing thing. It's sort of like Les Mis in that it's serious but with really singable music. Mm -hmm. There is all of the ethnic components to the story. It's set against the Ukrainian milieu, but it also has interest for people of Jewish background because the Romeo and Juliet story within the movie is that the Ukrainian Catholic falls in love with the woman who's the Jewish suffragette next door. So there's a Romeo and Juliet story. There's a really interesting story from the indigenous community. We have a character who's a Métis First World War veteran. It's a very little known aspect of Canadian history. Oh, wow. Um, And then an even lesser known part is the Oklahoman refugees, which were uh, refugees from Oklahoma between 1907 and 1919 until Canada stopped immigration of black people. And those people emigrated to Winnipeg, Regina, and Edmonton. In Edmonton, there was an all-black First World War regiment oh. in the town of Amber Valley near Vegreville. Talk oh. about a Ukrainian connection there. No kidding. was an all-black town. So much of the, quote-unquote, help uh, to the upper classes were these uh, black women who come from Oklahoma. We have that story. Emma Jones from Oklahoma. So it's this fascinating time capsule of history of Canada that's little known and of interest to many communities. And these were all true stories. This is all based on historical all true facts. Story. Yeah. Wow, wow. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. that American connection, um, mm-hmm. do you think that that will maybe uh, um, result in the movie being shown in the States in theaters? Uh, absolutely. Just this past weekend, the movie premiered at Santa Monica at the American Film Market. And just minutes ago, I sent the online screener to a large company in the United States. Many, many distributors are interested in the United States because it's a universal story. I'm telling you, when you see Americans watch it, you would think that it was an American movie. All this stuff is so clearly Canadian references mm-hmm. to Canada and Canadian Pacific Railway and singing mm-hmm. God Save the King. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've asked Americans, don't you notice that stuff? And they're like, nope, because <laughs> <laughs> they just see the story, the power of the story and the power of song. It is a very international movie, although clearly ours in the wellspring. So to answer your question, Absolutely, it will get released in the United States. We're hoping in a bigger way, but even a smaller way is is fantastic, you know. So yeah, wow. All we'll playing cards. Amazing. Amazing. I can tell you that it will be released. We know in Japan hmm. this past weekend we did a deal for Japan. So oh. yeah. So when would it be in um, airing in theaters in Japan and in the states? Probably about. February at the soonest, ah. but I, I don't know for sure. It could even come out before the end of the year in the United States. Wow. Fantastic. This is just an amazing story. Absolutely amazing. Your story is amazing. It has, <laughs> You're, I mean, it has, been, a, <laughs> it has been a life's work, and people ask me, so what's the next thing you're going to work on? <laughs> and the truth is, this is such a big project, it's probably two years before I could even consider doing anything else. Yeah. One day at a time. Yeah. Wow. Well, congratulations once again um, on this um, long, hard-won uh, success and in, um, in your career and in telling this great story that I, I think probably many people 
have wished over the years it could get get told, but had no inkling how to do it. And, and you just dug in and figured out how to do it. Um, you know, Winnipeg Boy made good. <laughs> and so your film called Stand, based on the 1919 Winnipeg General Strike. And tell us again where and when it'll be airing. It premieres on November 29th all across the country in Cineplex Theatres, cineplex.com. Okay, easy enough to find. And there's a Cineplex Theatre in pretty much um, every town, um, sizable town anyways, it has theatres. So mm-hmm. so that's great. And, of course, there's uh, information if anybody wants to find out more um, about the history, they can find you online. Yes, the best place to learn everything about the movie and to watch the trailer is Stand-movie.com. Stand-movie.com. Okay. And to find out about you and your work? There is a biography of myself on the website for the stage musical on which the movie is based, which is strikemusical.com. Okay. And of course, I'm mm-hmm. sure I'm sure you can get down a rabbit hole and find um, lots of other references for anybody that really wants to dig, oh, for sure. dig yeah. into the history. Yeah. Super. Well, thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you again, Danny, for uh, taking the time to talk to us and share your story. And um, congratulations once again. And good luck on the next uh, phase of this project, whatever it may be. <laughs> thank you. What a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks very much. I was speaking with Danny Schur composer, producer, and co-author of the stage musical Strike, which is now a movie called Stand, coming to a theater near you, coast to coast across Canada, on November 29th. Don't miss it. Tired of all the people who tell me I should just go sit down. I'm sick of being seen as feeble and being scared in my hometown. When you don't count me among your equals then don't expect me to just lie down so now I'm gonna stand on the strength of those shoulders of those who stand up and never back down these hands have the strength to move Boulders. I've drawn my line in the sand, and this is where I stand. I've had it with just Barely playing in a game 
And that is the soundtrack from the theme song for the movie Stand. And it is called Stand. It was written and composed by Danny Schur and performed by Lisa Bell. And make sure to take in the movie, which will be showing in Cineplex theaters across Canada starting November 29th. And our proverb of the week translates as to know what you don't know is the beginning of knowledge. And that brings us to the end of the first hour of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio here on CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. Please stay with us as Oksana takes over the microphone to host the next hour. Meanwhile, please join me here again next Wednesday from 11 a.m. till 12 noon. And until then, do stay in touch with both Oksana and me via our Facebook page and Twitter. In between broadcasts, visit us online where you'll find transcripts, audio archives, information about the show, and, of course, a link to the podcast feed, and that's www.nasholos.com. You can also find Nasholos on Mixcloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcast places, and, of course, on your favorite podcast app. And just a reminder again that this is Fun Drive Week, so if you like the programming that we provide you and think it's worth continuing, please consider making a donation if you haven't already, and you can do that by going to our website, chly.ca forward slash donate, and sign up as a sustaining donor there, or make a one-time donation, or give us a call and uh, chat with Arby or Jesse or one of the other fine people here at CHLY, and that number is 250-716-3410. Again, 250-716-3410 or chly.ca forward slash donate. So stay tuned next for the Nash Holos Ukrainian Hour with Oksana, followed by Wellness Wednesday to learn how to be healthy naturally. And at 2 p.m., join Gord Bibby for two hours of great oldies on Groovin' with Bibby G. I'm Paulina. Thanks so much for listening. Do zusrichi. <laughs>